you are an interesting breed of cat, as they would say back <laughs> in the day, because you are a never Trumper, but you are still a Republican and a yeah. conservative. Does that still exist in this country? Conservative more than Republican. There's no Republican Party anymore. It's dead. Donald Trump killed it. Like he's like a parasite that ate its host from the inside out. It's over. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm one of the small group of survivors from from the old school of limited government, individual freedom and liberty, constitutional adherence. You know, there's not mon not many of us. You could fit us around the table at a Waffle House most days, <laughs> but you know, we're still sort of trying to hold the line in this in this very crazed era. It's interesting that you say that because you know a lot of Republicans said that before Trump. Mm -hmm. became president. You know, we had people like Lindsey Graham on sure. the show. We had people like, you know, Rand Paul on the show. And they, they were all like, no, this is what we, we believe in. And Trump is not a Republican. Right. He became president and they were like, he's completely a Republican. So how do you begin to convince Republican voters that Donald Trump is not a Republican? Or has he just redefined what that is now? And is he the new conservative? Are you now an outlier? Well, those guys are what we refer to in the business as liars and cowards. <laughs> they are afraid of Donald Trump. They still hate him. Right. They still think he is a animated piece of excrement. They do not love this guy. They are afraid of him. And the few of us who are willing to call BS on him and speak openly and speak publicly and stand against him, you know, we may be the last priests of a dying religion, but we're going to try to uphold it as long as we can. He has broken the Republican Party. It doesn't believe in anything. Fiscal discipline, out the window. Mm -hmm. Limiting the size of government, out the window. All these things that he that these guys all said were vital to them. It followed the Constitution. You know, Ted Cruz used to say he'd set himself on fire if you didn't follow the Constitution. And now he's like, you know, whatever. It, it doesn't <laughs> matter at all to them anymore. And so they have let themselves be so debased and, and so utterly compromised that th they think we're the aliens. They think we're the outliers. They think we're the wrong ones. But I'm sorry, you gotta call it like it, like it really is. And they have given themselves over to a cult. It's interesting that you that you say this because I, I I do appreciate that you have not like switched sides or anything. You know, it's not like you've gone like, no, I'm now a Democrat. You're saying, no, look, I'm still a conservative. I don't think Donald Trump represents our values. No. This book is interesting because you say running against the devil, plot to save America from Trump. But then interestingly enough, you say, and Democrats from themselves. Sure. So then tell me what that means. What advice do you think you could possibly give to Democrats, even though you wouldn't exist in a world where you would normally vote for them? So for 30 years, me and guys like me built a very smart, very sophisticated system to wreck the hell out of Democratic candidates. And we did it all over the country. Until Donald Trump came along, there was a period of about 20 years where we took almost 2,000 seats away from the Democrats across the country in state legislatures, in Congress, in the Senate. We took over control of 38 state governments and legislatures over that time. We did it by being better at the root politics, at the hard politics. We did it by being willing to do things that were very tough, by running ads that were very tough and made people lose their minds. Right. And we did it by running candidates who fit with their states and districts. So, look, I helped elect a Republican governor in Vermont four times. Now, that is not an easy task. But our guy wasn't a perfect Republican. He wasn't a super hard right evangelical Southerner. He was a guy who fit Vermont. And it worked. And the Democrats tend to have this thing of ideological homogeneousness. They want everybody to be the same policy perspective, whether you're in San Francisco or whether you're in Virginia or whether oh, you're in Alabama. And so we were able to put candidates out there who were not, you know, they didn't fit every single ideological test. Right. But we won a lot of seats that way. So, so are you saying, if I'm understanding correctly, are you then saying that Republicans have always played to win yeah. And Democrats play to be right. Democrats play to win an argument. I play to win an election. I don't care how I get to the finish line. And I, uh, you know, except for breaking the law, and occasionally you get breaking the law adjacent, but <laughs> you want to make sure that you get to the goal line. And sometimes that means not saying what's on your mind. Sometimes that means saying, oh, well, look, our polling tells us Medicare for all scares the crap out of suburban right. women. But let's talk about Medicare for all, because why would we need suburban women? You know, this is the Democrats fall into these traps that they build for themselves. So then how would you <clears throat> how would you how would you break that then? What would what would you say to a Democrat tonight where you go like these people are running and at some point one of them is going to be head to head sure. with Donald Trump? At some point they're going to have to try and fight for those hundred thousand right. odd votes that swung the electoral right. college. Right? We've seen that it's not a numbers game, it's an <laughs> electoral college game. It absolutely. So is. How would you then say to one of those people, hey, this is how you can win while still maintaining your democratic values? Right. First off, win the game, 
before you try to start declaring the victory conditions and start saying, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Ideological promises are a trap. <clears throat> when you promise people something and build a, a plan and a policy in modern campaigns, that's an invitation for me to put my nerds to work and look through your 600-page healthcare plan and find 10 things that scare the crap out of people. Huh. And then I make ads about them. And then you run for the hills and you, look, you don't understand why people suddenly can't, can't they, they say things to you that you know aren't quite true about your right, policy, right, you get right. deeper and deeper in the weeds. But the three things a Democrat has to do in this election, they have to fight where the fight is. The Electoral College, whether you love it or hate it, is the only game in town. That's the only game there is. So you've got to fight in Wisconsin and Florida and Pennsylvania and Ohio and Arizona and a handful of states. The election is over in California. I know how they're going to vote. I know how Mississippi is going to vote. Those are things that are done. You got to fight where the fight is. You got to put the resources because they will not have as much money as Donald Trump, unless it's Mike Bloomberg and then he has more money than God. <clears throat> you've got to put it into the states that matter. And then you've got to target in the states even more finely. And they will target, you know, the Democrats are smart. They will be targeting those suburban women who are right. breaking away from the GOP. They'll be targeting those Obama Trump voters. Uh -huh. They'll be targeting those Bernie Trump voters. Right. They'll be going after narrow slices because this is a game of small numbers, it's not a game of big numbers. The most important thing, though, is the, refer the, the election has to be a referendum on Donald Trump. It's not about policy. It's not about your health care plan, your climate change plan. All those are important and they're lovely, but it's a referendum on Donald Trump. All re-elections are referendums on the incumbent. So then, if, if, if I can say this, because we're going to have to wrap up soon, but essentially what you're saying sounds really interesting, because I, I remember saying this when I first observed Donald Trump mm -hmm. during the election. I said, and I mean, you, some people treated me like an idiot for saying it. I said, on TV, the one advantage he has is that he's playing TV. Yes. So when he says, build a wall, it translates into whatever people want to hear about immigration. Mm -hmm. He doesn't give you the specifics right. about H-1B right. visas. He doesn't give you the specifics about what immigration numbers or policies. He just gives you ideas. Trevor, his whole policy fit on a trucker hat. <laughs> you know? He, right. That, that, and, the, and you're exactly right, because what he did was play a reality TV character for 15 years, and Americans thought, oh, this guy is smart, decisive, good right, manager, right, good right. leader, good negotiator. And so he just kept playing that role. So do you think then Democrats, maybe even not, if not now, need to get better at playing TV for they when they're absolute, running against this Trump? This is a reality TV game. They need to be practicing that game. It's not a debating society in the Democratic Socialist Conference. It's a reality TV show. And Trump is the master of the game. They have a narrow path to victory. And I hope that this book helps them try to uh, achieve that fairly narrow path. Well, I'll tell you this. I wish I could disagree with you, but I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Thank you so much for being Thank on the show. Really it. great having you here. <laughs> Running Against the Devil is available now. Rick Wilson, everybody.